uh, scribe in the cave. Apparently, most of the writing was done inside there, and it's a pretty big cave. It's not, you know, it's not you don't have to crawl in or anything. You can, you know, sit comfortably, walk around. Um, and then I thought, well, I've, I've, that's my key to debunking the revelation myth. But um, and there is such a thing as cave gas. Basically, that when carbon dioxide levels rise above about three percent. One is prone to hallucinations and visions. It's just it's 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 a physiological thing. Um, and I was all set to you know that was going to be my attack on that on the chapter of the book until I thought about it and I thought you know the Prophet Muhammad um, received the Quran while he was meditating in a cave over a series of meditations and he was either illiterate or barely literate depending on on, on which history you believe. But he certainly was not educated to the point where he was capable of creating the greatest masterwork in the history of the Arabic language. And he did so inside a cave. And so I thought, well, if it's good enough for Muhammad and it's good enough for John, maybe I shouldn't be so snooty. Um, Could you feel something in there? Yes. And I, I felt this. Uh, it's got an energy about it, doesn't it? Yeah, and it was a great ease. It was, it was, you know how some folks describe near-death experiences as being liberating and, and comforting. I mean, I, I find that absolutely foreign to the. You know, I, I don't want to die. I, I never want to die. You know, <laughs> and um, so the idea of, of this 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 pleasurable sensation as, as people approach death it always mystified me. But there, I could see it. It, it. it it felt like a portal to something else. And as I was in there, you know, not wanting to leave, just just getting into the, the feeling, the spirit of it, um, I thought, well, maybe there's something to getting a little bit high in this way, and maybe, it, you know, it, it just because it, it, it causes your brain to function differently, that doesn't invalidate um, what your brain does, you know. Again, right. Muhammad and John, uh, both pretty formidable literary figures in our history, you know, um, um, but I still I wanted to find out what the, the um, Abbot Antipas was his name um, believed about where are we in the progress of the story and it was not difficult to get to, to meet him um, he was he's a gracious man but um, I made a big mistake I, I, I my first book was uh, called Gaia the growth of an idea and Gaia is the name of the Greek goddess of the earth. And so I mentioned that I had written this book because I thought oh, I'm in Greece. I, you know, my first book was about a Greek date. I thought that would in, in, endear me, but it had exactly the opposite effect. They pegged me as a goddess worshiper from California, which is, is not what the, the uh, Greek Orthodox uh, abbot wanted to be receiving and, you know, communicating with. Uh, and they, his subordinate uh, tried to boot me out. Um, when I went to see the abbot, you know, because he, you know, he had me as basically some new age wacko. Mm. Um, but I, I can, I can sit down with the best of them, you know, and I sort of refused to get up and, um, and held my own for about an hour and a half of, of arguing. And finally the abbot received me and, and agreed to an interview. And after a lot of feints and jabs, I finally got into to, to commit, I said, "Well, where are we? If we're not at the the absolute end of, of things, and because you know, there's, I think it's Mark 23. Um, no man shall know the, the exact uh, the exact time when the end will come. Um, a, a paraphrase, but it catches the sense of it. Um, where are we in the process?" And he said that we're at the beginning of the end. We're at the beginning of the last section. And that's where uh, the great s Satan... Um, well, you, you know, those civilizations since the beginning of time have always felt they were in the apocalypse. All of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and John's sense of time was not his strong point. I mean, you know, there's a thousand years here and a thousand years there, and, you know, it was very difficult. But... Um, uh, for, for Father Antipas, he said, we are at the, the stage where we, we, we must fear the mark of the beast. I thought, well, what does that mean? You know, and, and what is your impression of that? You know, we, we've had many people on the program 
they've talked about the mark of the beast, but uh, you know they they think that it has something to do with just the ability to buy and sell. You know, maybe they're going to give us a code, a number to use, maybe a chip, a computer chip. That's exactly what what Abbott and Tebas thought. Exactly. Really. They said, Never let them stick a chip in you or your animal. He said, "You carry around a cell phone, don't you?" And I said, "Yes, I do." He said, "That's the beginning of it." He said. Um, it, it, it seems like it's for convenience, but actually it's, it's, it's to d- deprive you of your liberty and disrupt your, your, your connection with God. And um, I thought, you know, um, here's a, here are folks who live, well, they practice what they preach. I mean, these folks live very simply, uh, they live well, but uh, very simply and are not, you know, they do not have electronic extensions um, built into their persons or on their persons. And, he, you know, he said, mark my words, um, by the time your children grow up, they will be under intense pressure to to be electronically imprinted. Oh, there's no doubt. You know, that that is an interesting statement right there, Lawrence. Our kids or their kids... What will society be when they start telling them, you know, we want you all to have this little chip in the palm of your hand. All you got to do, you don't have any more ATM cards or credit cards. You don't have any of that. The computers have everything interlocked with everything. So if you've got eight credit cards, it's all in this little chip. And all you simply do is wave it over this little machine and you're all set. I bet that's going to happen. I bet they're going to force feed people. They're going to pass legislation that you have to have that done. And somebody says, well, no, they're not. Wait wait a minute. You can't work today in the United States without a Social Security card, right? Unless you're illegal, of course. Right. You know, if you're a legal worker, you have to get a Social Security card. It's the law. What's to stop them from saying the law is you must have this chip? You know, uh, I had a little experience with that that, that, that that frightened me just in the vein you're saying. Um, Perhaps you might have occasionally heard during the course of our conversation, my dog in the background, who's kind of a noisy creature. I love animals. Oh, good, because he, I, I do too, fun. but he, he, you know, he's he's a handful sometimes. What kind of dog do you have? Uh, miniature poodle. Okay. Max. Yeah. And um, uh, I took him to the, the veterinarian when, when he was just a puppy, and the, the veterinarian happened to be kind of expensive. He was in Beverly Hills, where things tend to be a little pricey. And I remember, you know, just looking at the, the numbers for what this would cost and that would cost. And for fifty dollars, uh, he offered to implant a chip in my dog, uh, so it would never get lost. And, and, and it was just so much less than, you know, like the you know, every other aspect of the examination and the treatment. I was like. Uh, it, it it made me say no. Good. And, you know, some of those uh, dogs are getting tumors near near where they put chips. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. That's happening. And also, when they've got a chip in the dog, the dog, tracking the dog is one way of tracking you. I mean, they, they, they've... Sure. Uh, uh, and it was just so funny because everything else is like 115 bucks, And, you know, just everything was expensive except that was the one bargain. Because it was a procedure and it was a, it was a chip and you know I was like how, how come they're offering this for fifty bucks you know what's what's you know? how are they going to put it in, inject it in a in a in a needle or do they have to slice them and put it in uh, I think they're going to slice them and then stitch them up yeah that's a you know that's a, a you know you that's a fairly complicated procedure at least more than fifty bucks worth and um, it hit me you know, after I got home and and, and you know, recall that that. Uh, that maybe there's something to it, um, and you know, Father Antipas, his his point was that the the time frame of the Book of Revelation is vague and elastic, and what we can do, we we can't forestall the inevitable as he sees it, but what we we, we can't prevent it, but we can forestall it. Excuse me, and we we can keep things from happening. We can keep uh, things from pro- progressing downhill towards the cataclysmic end. Um, he said, and of course, if you believe that the next life is better than this one and, and being closer to God is preferable to, to, your, to, to life here, you might not feel that we, we want to forestall the end, but you might want to hasten it. But that's, you know, that's, 
a matter of individual.